Good morning. morning. (laughs) Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I wonder if there's anybody else here like me who has started a project but then failed to finish it. Do you have unfinished projects, perhaps, around the house? Maybe you made a commitment, and then you got distracted and did something else. For me, this is my garage. That's been going on for a while. It seems every year I make a commitment, when the weather cools down a little bit, the winter, make a commitment to cleaning out and organizing the garage, then I get distracted. So this has happened now for about 10 years, (laughs) pretty pretty long time. Moved down here from New York and everything is just as it was when we moved in the garage. We don't have basements here, so that's kind of why I guess, and the attic is too hot. I once heard a story about a young boy whose father had an issue with commitment. It seemed like there were all these unfinished projects around the house, all over the place. Half-painted rooms, even. Spilled out onto the lawn, half-mowed lawn, half-set-up swing set, half-planted garden. Now, I've noticed something. Neighbors notice, right? So, oh, my neighbor's a pastor. He's perfect until my garage door opens, right? Ah, not so much. Neighbors notice, and in this case, there was a neighbor that noticed this father's lack of commitment, lack of follow through on things. In particular, this particular neighbor noticed it in the little boy. He was an older man, and he noticed one day the boy playing by himself. He was playing catch by himself, kind of a sad picture, throwing the ball up, running after it and catching it himself. Throwing against a wall, trying to bounce it, catching it in the mitt. And sadly, he noticed that there was an extra mitt on the ground, clearly intended for the father. You see, the father would make commitments to his son, but then not follow through all the time. He would get distracted. So the old man decided to do something. He asked this boy's father if he could take him to the circus. Kind of an old school thing. But the old man explained, you see, I have a son, but he's all grown up now. I used to take him to the circus. It brought me great joy to do that. But you see, my son, he's all grown up, and he doesn't have kids of his own. He lacks commitment. So I have no grandkids. So the father, he's like, sure, whatever. He doesn't really care. The boy is not really excited. Circus, kind of an old school thing. It's weird, whatever. Just want to play video games. But he goes, and then he's pleasantly surprised. He gets there under the big top. It's like one of those three ring circuses. He's sitting close. The elephants are enormous. He's never seen anything like this, for real. On the screen on his phone, they're kind of small. But here, it's all real. His eyes are opened to this whole new thing. The trapeze artist, death-defying stunts. All this stuff is going on, it's crazy. The clown car, how do you fit that many clowns in a little car like that? But most of all, what was most impressive to this little boy was the lion tamer. Everybody loves the lion tamer. The lion comes out and its head is huge. If you've ever seen a lion in real life, first thing I notice is that head is really big. It looks like it can chomp me in half in one bite. It was amazing. And the boy noticed it wasn't even on a chain. That's crazy. The lion tamer was so brave, he grabbed his stool, picked it up, and started whipping at the lion. Sure enough, he subdued it. He was just amazed. And so the old man took this as an opportunity to teach him something. Like good teachers, he asked a question. He said, what do you suppose the lion tamer's most powerful weapon was? Easy. He only had one weapon. It was the whip. Wrong, the old man said. It was a stool. I said, that's crazy. The stool? The lion could have just chomped that in half. It didn't do anything. Well, yes, maybe if it had one leg. 
boy was confused. The old man explained, let me tell you something about lions. Lions are very committed creatures. Once they lock on to a target, that's it. They commit to it and they do not give up until the job is done. But the stool has four legs. And this distracts the lion because the lion gets confused in his commitment and he doesn't know what to commit to. And so in this confusion, the lion backs down. And the whip, it's just for show. It didn't do a thing. You see, distraction is a powerful tool that can cause confusion in our commitment. Today we find ourselves in the rest of the story. I would like to first thank David from Mission India. He gave a very powerful message last week. Again, not getting diverted or distracted from our purpose in Christ. He talked about winning people to Christ, not the argument. Very, very important. The week before that, we looked at the life of King David in particular. He conquered Jebus, that becomes Jerusalem later, Zion, the city of David. He wants to move the ark in, but what? He doesn't follow instructions the first time, and it doesn't go well. Second time, yes, but we saw he did weird stuff, causing people to ask the question, why, maybe? So we looked at that. Why, God? Why are you doing things this way? We learned that sometimes it's not for us to know. And that's called faith. That's what faith is all about. And faith means following instructions. So today, we'll be looking at a very famous account, the account of David and Bathsheba. But first, I explain this to you and I'll tell you again, 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles are running in parallel now. And like the Gospels, if you're familiar with the New Testament a little bit more, there are certain things that the author is going to add, decide to tell you about. Maybe they're not in one, they are in the other, and vice versa. And this is what is happening here. You can look at it this way. 1 Chronicles is kind of a technical perspective on these accounts, on this timeline. Whereas Samuel is a little bit more of a personal perspective. You get that right from the very beginning of 1 Chronicles, 1 through 9, massive genealogies. There's really not a lot of storytelling there, and you don't get to, into like stories until chapter 10. It doesn't happen there, and it begins with the death of Saul. So today, we're going to look at 1 Chronicle, Chronicles, and then I'll insert these stories from 2 Samuel, putting them in for you chronologically. This can be very confusing, and I'm trying to unconfuse it for you. 1 Chronicles 17, which is 2 Samuel 7-ish, <laughs> the ark has been moved now, and David wants to build a temple. 1 Chronicles 17, 1, when David was settled in his palace, he summoned Nathan the prophet. Look, David said, I am living in a beautiful cedar palace, and the ark of the Lord's covenant is out there under a tent. Nathan replied to David, do whatever you have in mind, for God is with you. But that same night, God said to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. You are not the one to build a house for me to leave, live in. I've never lived in a house. From the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day, my home has always been in a tent, moving from one place to another in a tabernacle. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never once complained to Israel's leaders, the shepherds of my people. I have never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? So the Lord goes on to, I'll summarize this for you, to tell David that one of his sons will build this temple for him. We know it's Solomon. He is not quite yet. He'll build the temple. God says, I'll be like a father to him. I'll discipline him, but I won't completely reject him like I did 
Saul. I'll be with him. So we'll read about Solomon later. So David, he prays to the Lord, and he concludes with this. First Chronicles 17, 25. Oh my God, I've been bold enough to pray to you because you have revealed to your servant that you will build a house for him, a dynasty of kings, for your God, O Lord. And you have promised these good things to your servant. And now it has pleased you to bless the house of your servant so that it will continue forever before you. For when you grant a blessing, O Lord, it is an eternal blessing. If we turn the page, we get to 1 Chronicles 18, which is 2 Samuel 8. Ish, minor differences here and there. We see a series of military victories. These are kind of important over a bunch of different people groups. We see the Philistines, Moab, he's not very nice to them. He executes a lot of people. King Hadadezer of the Arameans, Ammon, and Amalek. After 1 Chronicles 18, before we get to 19, we find one of these other accounts not in there. Remember Mephibosheth. In 2 Samuel 9, we see that David, and it states he fulfills a promise to Jonathan that he had made to Jonathan, Saul's son, their buddies, but also to Saul, if you're looking very carefully at the accounts, not to harm his family, not only that, but to do good to them, to treat them with kindness. 2 Samuel 9, 1. One day, David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Well, there's a servant named Ziba. Remember his name. Something about him will come up a little later, not today, but later in the rest of the story. Ziba was one of Saul's servants. David summons him. Are you Ziba? Yes, I am. Is there anyone left alive in Saul's family? Yes, there is. Mephibosheth. Now, if you remember him, when Jonathan and Saul died, The maidservant picked him up, tried to run away with him, dropped him, and now he has crippled feet. He's five years old at the time. Now he's much older, has family of his own. So basically, he's like, Ziba, get him, bring him here. He comes, Mephibosheth, he bows down to him. I am your servant, David says. Everything that belonged to Saul is now yours, including Ziba and his servants and his family. It's all yours. And you're safe here. So he spends a lot of time there with David eating in the palace. Now, if we turn to 1 Chronicles 19, there's kind of an interesting account here. This is 2 Samuel 10-ish. If you have been paying attention to the rest of the story, you remember a guy named King Nahash. He wasn't very nice. If you go back to 1 Samuel 11, you see that Saul had to deal with him. Because he approaches the people of Jabesh Gilead and he threatens them. Yeah, you can surrender to me, but guess what? When you do, we're going to gouge out everybody's right eye. Kind of gross. Saul gets mad and he attacks them, but he doesn't kill the king. So here we get David saying, King Nahash dies. And he says, I'm going to go pay tribute to him because he was always kind to me. And so that should strike you as a little weird. So I guess like, He was nice to David, but not Saul. Very strange. But here's what happens. He sends ambassadors or messengers to him. And his advisors say, no, they're spies. Don't trust them. So they embarrass him, (laughs) them. They cut off their robes at the behinds, and they shave off half their beards. Now, (laughs) this is very embarrassing. I know partially from experience, and I'm not going to tell that story. But if someone gets drunk at your house and passes out all the time, you can shave one of their eyebrows off. They'll stop doing it. Anyway, just saying. (laughs) Not, well, never mind. What did you learn in church? That's what you're going to (laughs) remember. That's it. That's it. Forget about, uh, my pastor said it's okay to, no, it's not. It's also not okay to get drunk at people's houses and pass out. So anyway, (laughs) the people of Ammon, they realize he's an Ammonite king. (laughs) People of Ammon realize that they've angered David, so they make this alliance with the Arameans for a lot of money, like 75,000 pounds of silver, and they go to attack David. There's a series of battles, one, then two. Joab is the commander of the army. They win, and the Arameans eventually say, forget it, we're not dealing with these Ammonites ever again just to kind of cover that. If we turn to chapter 20, 
This is where it can be very confusing, and I hope I make it simple for you. Chapter 20, we see that David is going to attack Rabbah, the Ammonite city. And then it says that when he gets there, he conquers the city. Then we get an account, this is very confusing, about all these really weird uh, Philistine giants. Goliath's brother, one with like six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. He carries a spear, just like Goliath does, as big as a weaver's beam. That is Goliath's brother, not the six-fingered person. He's Lamai. But confusing because you have to go to 2 Samuel chapter 21 to read that. It doesn't run quite parallel. So, But the interesting thing here is that in the middle of that account about Rabbah, and it's really quick in 1 Chronicles, there's the whole story of David and Bathsheba that happens right there. So you kind of have to like read the first couple of verses and then hop over, and that's what we're going to do today. 2 Samuel 11 and 12, those chapters. 2 Samuel 11, 1. In the spring of the year when kings normally, got to pay very close attention to the wording, normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. So they're there and they're laying siege to this walled city. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So here's the timeline. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. Kind of normalish. I've explained that to you. Sometimes people would sleep up on the roof because it's cooler up there. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. Did that. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So just a pause button there. She's not Bathsheba because she's taking a bath. <laughs> Daughter of the oath, you know, Beersheba, the well of the oath. So so Bathsheba, Bath is just daughter of the oath. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Okay, so the thing about the menstrual period, it's not in there to be gross. It's in there so that you have no doubt that David is the father of the child, it's not Uriah. So it's a timeline thing. Again, that's why that's there. So what does David do? Well, he calls for her husband, who's out on the battle lines, Uriah. And he figures he's going to get there and then spend some time with his wife. He'll sleep with his wife. Ah, They'll think the kid's his. Doesn't work. He decides to sleep with the palace guards. And David's like, what are you doing? It's not working. Well, how could I do that? When the commander of the army, all my friends, you know, soldiers are fighting out there. I can't do this type of thing. So David's like, okay, I'll get him drunk. Doesn't shave his eyebrows off. He just gets him drunk, but he doesn't go to be with his wife. He stays again with the guards. So what does David do? Well, He writes a letter to Joab. If you read it carefully, it's kind of crazy because he sends Uriah with the letter. And it's basically his death sentence. He tells Joab, who's happy to comply. We know about Joab's character here. And he basically says, send Uriah out to where the fighting is the heaviest. And then when it gets real heated, withdraw from him so that he dies. Okay. And so he does that. Joab sends a message back to David. And it's kind of interesting because at first he's giving him like a battle report and he's saying, well, if David questions you and says something like, why did you do that? Why did you send him close to the wall in a bad spot or them, not Uriah yet? Why did you send them there? It's a military mistake. You ever watch like medieval movies and stuff? This is older, but the battle kind of strategies didn't change very much for thousands of years. If you're laying siege to a castle or walled town, it's hard. Usually the best strategy is to wait them out. They'll run out of food or water, and you see this in the Bible. They'll cut off water supplies. Hezekiah will do that later in order to either protect themselves, deprive the enemy of water, stuff like that. You've got to wait. It takes a while. 
you don't run up to the wall. If you're in a hurry and you do, you're going to use something like a siege tower, right? Because the people on the wall are shooting arrows down at you, boiling oil, rocks, things like that. Don't worry, Lonnie, I won't throw anything on you from up here. But anyway, you know, you don't want to do that. And so that's exactly what happens. Sends them real close to the wall, shoots arrows down on them, he's dead. So if David asks you why I did this, well, and he may even say something. He'll recall Abimelech, Gideon's son, who went up to the wall, and remember the woman throws the millstone down over his head? I said, don't underestimate a woman. He dies, he's embarrassed about it, and he has his armor bearer run him through so that they can't say a woman killed him. Anyway, he actually recalls that account. He might be upset about this, this blunder, but tell him, your eye's dead, because he knows on the back end that's going to make him kind of happy. So, <laughs> this happens, the messenger comes back, and David's just basically like, whatever, the sword devours some this day, and others on the other day, tell him to fight harder, and he'll take the city. But the Lord is not happy about this. So, 2 Samuel 12, 1, the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to tell David this story. It's a parable. Jesus teaches in parables. It's like there was this rich man with all these sheep and cattle. And then there was a poor man, just like Jesus does, this kind of contrast. There was a poor man. He had this one little baby lamb that he bought. It was like a pet. It eats at his table and drinks from his cup. Well, the rich man had a visitor come into his house. And instead of slaughtering one of his own many sheep or cattle for the feast, he slaughtered the poor man's little baby lamb, the pet. David's infuriated. This man should die. He should pay back four times what he took for that man. Nathan says, that man is you. And then rebukes him. He says, this is what the Lord says. Since you've done this, you've murdered a man, you've slept with his wife, the sword will be against your family from now on. I'll send a man to sleep with your wives, but he's going to do it out in the open, not in secret like you've done. We're going to see this happen. It's a very tragic story of Absalom. It's going to be his son. Spoiler alert. Crazy. David confesses his sin. Nathan, don't worry. You're not going to die from this. You've been forgiven, but, but your son is. The son that you made with Bathsheba is going to die. Nathan leaves. Seven days later, the child dies. In the meantime, David, he's mourning for the child, begging the Lord not to kill him, fasting. Sees the messengers talking about the child, knows that the child is dead. Is the child dead? Yes, but they're afraid to tell him. They think David might harm himself or something. And something unusual happens. David gets up, cleans himself up, goes to worship, and eats. The servants are like, that's weird. You should be mourning now that the baby's dead. David says this, 2 Samuel 12, 22. David replied, I fasted and wept while the child was alive, for I said, perhaps the Lord will be gracious to me and let the child live. But why should I fast when he's dead? Can I bring him back again? I will go home one day, but he cannot return to me. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and slept with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to his son. And David named him Solomon. Pay attention to this. The Lord loved the child and sent word through Nathan the prophet that they should name him Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord, as the Lord had commanded. How many people knew that? Solomon's God-given name is Jedidiah. Interesting. David was doing so well. His military victories, crazy. He's doing well. Kindness to Mephibosheth. He's doing well. His covenant with the Lord, he's doing well. But David got distracted. He abandoned his purpose by staying home from war. When kings usually go out to war, he might have had too much free time on his hands. He got distracted up there on the roof. Then he went 
from one sin to the next to cover up the first one. Sin is a slippery slope. He was doing great in his covenant with the Lord. Then he covets. David compromises the covenant through coveting. Gets distracted. But do we do that as well? Do we get distracted? Maybe in our walk with the Lord, in a broader sense. We start off really well. We're really excited. We're high off that baptism. We're doing things right, but then something takes us off course. We're not doing so good anymore. We're all in in the beginning, but something distracts us from our destination. Maybe like David, we have too much free time on our hands. Maybe we start off the week well. We do the Sunday to Sunday thing. We get in a good word on Sunday. We, we worship. I'm not going to do the batteries recharge thing. <laughs> you know I hate that. But we get built up in the Lord, edified, so to speak. We do really well, and then we leave church and... We forget about all of the promises we sung on Sunday. We get distracted somehow. You see, we shouldn't covet things because it will often cause us to compromise our commitment to Christ. If something will, we need to identify it and Remove it. Think of it this way. If you're new, don't worry. Repent. <laughs> it's a big word, right? It just means to turn from something, to just repent from it. Just basically think of it that way. But I suggest you do almost like a pre-repentance. This has worked for me in my life. A pre in other words, remove the things so you don't even have to turn from them. How about that, right? Think about it if your issue is alcohol. Don't go to the bar. You're kind of asking for it, right? It's food. That's been a big thing, right? The whole lockdown and all that stuff. Some people went crazy. Well, when you're grocery shopping, don't buy the junk food. Don't go through the drive through Don't be a part of it. Let's be honest, for a lot of people, the sin's in your phone, where it is. Remove the app. I've had to do that with certain things. For pastors, it's social media. You want to get really agitated if you're a pastor? Look at what your people are posting on social media. <laughs> Chasing, winning arguments. They win a lot. Christians are great at winning arguments, right? But not so good at winning people over to Christ. And so that's really agitating. So on my day off, I don't look at that. I put it a few swipes away from where it's easy to get to. I should know better. Another thing, accountability companions. My wife is mine, and it works somehow. I don't know how in a marriage. It's not always a good thing to do. But anyway, maybe get a friend. But she does that. She caught me on the one and only day that I commit to them. Why are you doing that? You're working. Ah, thank you. Remove the app. No good. You can get a friend. You can get a friend, an accountability partner, humble yourself, confess. The Bible says to do that, you know. Confess your sins to one another. Make sure that this person can be trusted. They're not a gossip. Got to test that out. I know some of you have been burned by things like that. But here at C3 Church, there are people you can trust. Get an accountability companion, a friend. A friend that doesn't talk to you like your pride does. It doesn't talk to you like your pride does. They'll lovingly bring you into correction when they see something that is not right. You see, our pride tells us that we can play with fire and we won't get burned. That's what our pride tells us. 
But we must get rid of that pride. We must humble ourselves and accept the accountability. Proverbs 29, 23. Pride ends in humiliation, while humility brings honor. I've learned something. All pride. There's no such thing as good pride. I was told that in the beginning of my Christian walk. I had to mull it over. But the more I read the Bible, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say pride in your achievements. <laughs> no, it says the opposite. It actually doesn't even say pride in your country. It doesn't say that. That's not true. Pride in anything will lead to disaster. It will distract you from the kingdom of heaven. It will cause you to go off course from your commitment to Christ, period. That's what pride does every single time. Our pride tells us that we can flirt with our former sin. That's what it tells us. It leads to destruction. We must remove it, repent from it, because once it's been done, even if we do turn from it, even if there's a course correction, there's still wreckage we have to deal with. Still wreckage. David's family, we're going to read about it in the weeks to come. They're going to pay the price for his sin. Death of a child, too. He pays the price. We can't let these distractions detour us from our commitment to Christ. And that means anything that will distract you. And there are a lot of things in the world trying to do that. Like everything in the world is trying to do that. Church has become a lot like the fitness industry. Bear with me. It has, if you think about it rightly. Think about it. What do people do? They join the gym. I'm going to join the gym. We did this, what, January, right? So we decide we're going to join the gym, and they give us all the stuff at the gym. Right? You get the T-shirt. You get the keychain ornament. Maybe the sticker for your car so everybody knows you're going to the gym. Right? And you start off well. You do some exercises, and then maybe there's a trainer there, and the trainer tells you what to do. Okay. But what do you do? What do most of us do? I shouldn't say, what do you do? What do most of us do? In some in shape people. Most people do the gym thing. Then they go out and they hit the drive through. <laughs> they do everything that the trainer told them not to do. Don't do that. Oh, yeah, I got it. Right? Everything. They come back, they haven't lost any weight. <laughs> Trainer's like, well, and now here's the thing there are two different kinds of gyms, maybe more. But like really good gyms where the trainer rebukes you. <laughs> take off the shirt, take the sticker off the car, you're embarrassing me. That's what a good gym does. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a good gym. But what happens when a gym does that? They get small. What happens when a church does that? They get small. Why? I'll tell you why. That's what the other gyms are, are telling them they should do. No commitment. No commitment. Look at that. <sighs> Think there are a lot of in-shape people there? No. I know that. I'm not going to name the gym. We know what one it is. But, right? Keychain ornaments, that's what they get. Ooh, I'm doing so good. So they don't see results. And guess what? It's the trainer's fault. Oh, it's, it's the trainer's fault. I don't know. It's their fault. This, this gym didn't work for me. They'll blame it on the gym. That gym's no good. It didn't work for me. No, you weren't working out. That's the problem. Heard that about church? Ah! Like, that church didn't work for me. No, you weren't working it. That was the problem. Probably a pretty good church. There are lots of them. But the problem for the pretty good churches is that there's a lot of churches like that. That's the problem. A lot of other places you can end up. They won't say any of this stuff. They're going to make you feel great. 
that's great, you gained 10 pounds, congratulations. <laughs> you know? But they're not gonna talk about sin. They're not gonna talk about commitment. That's a bad word. What do you think would happen if we put that on the outside of the church? C3 church, no commitment. Man, this place would be full, right? We'd have to do another service. I'm not gonna do that again, don't worry. Right? But this is what happens. There are too many people who treat Christianity like a keychain ornament. That's it. They get the Jesus fish on the car. They're good. I'm a Christian, a little C3 sticker. If you're cutting people off in traffic and cursing them out, please take the C3 sticker off the car. Just, just saying. Stop embarrassing me. Christ requires commitment. And Christianity needs to turn from the commercialism. It's cheapened it. Christianity needs to turn its focus back to Christ and Christ alone. The world is competing against the word. Constant struggle for your commitment. It wants to distract you. So you're going to open up your phone, your Bible app, and what does it do? It gives you a whole lot of other options that you'll choose instead. So maybe get a paper Bible, read that. I don't know. But it is fighting. It is fighting for your commitment. It wants your attention, but we cannot let it distract us from our destination. Important. Remember what David from Mission India said last week. We're just passing through. That's very hard for people to understand, but it's very biblical. I told you about sojourning. It's very Bible study. We read all of 1 Peter, except like the last part, last chapter. Passing through, sojourning. We're temporary. How many times say temporary residents? That's what we are as Christians. We belong to the kingdom of heaven. This is all just very, very, very temporary. That's it. And while we're going through, we need to be focused on that destination. We can't let anyone veer us from the course. Stay on track. We need to do this, what Proverbs says. 4, 23, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Now, here's what a lot of y'all are saying. How? How? There's so much noise. It's like trying to concentrate while you're taking a test and everyone's screaming and yelling, all kinds of distractions. Yeah, I get it. But there's something for paying attention a lot more powerful, a lot louder. The Bible tells us how. The instructions are all in there, everything we need to know. Hebrews 12.1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, that is chapter 11, all the people of faith who passed the test, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. How? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. That's how. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Think about that. Then you won't become weary and give up. Fix our eyes on Jesus on him, and think about what he did before you complain about your life. Then you won't get tripped up in sin. Worship him. David said this too, right, last week. 
not Dave King David, but David from Mission India. We worship what we do most of the time. Ooh, ouch, ouch. We worship, that hit, I heard that long before he said it. And when that hit me, I realized everything had to change. Not because I'm a pastor. Yes, that's a part of it. We need to be in the word a lot. But because I'm a Christian, I started thinking about it. What did we do at Bible study? How long did it take to read all of 1 Peter? Was it a half hour? 25 minutes. Carolee's counting. 25 minutes. I'm a fast reader, but, but here's the thing. We're going a tiny bit over, sorry. <clears throat> but here's the thing. This is important. I put commentaries in there. I did it with commentary, half hour. I looked up and I said, who here watches a sitcom? You ever watch a sitcom? You do that every day? It's half hour. How many of them do you watch a night? How many half hours do you spend reading the Bible? Think about it. But you know what? When I'm reading the Word of God, none of the other stuff distracts me. I'm not thinking about any of that other stuff. So try it out. Just a little bit. I get it. It's hard. I've messed up. Maybe, perhaps, one of you here today has messed up. I don't know. But if we're being honest, I think we mess up sometimes. It's okay. God is willing to forgive and he wants to bring you back. But we should do so with a greater commitment. That's my point. David struggled too. David wrote a lot of the Psalms, probably about a half-ish of them. He writes about his heart and his struggle as he too is sojourning through. And so look to the Psalms for worship, for encouragement, to relate. God gets it. So today I want to finish by worshiping from the Psalms, by praying from the Psalms this morning. And we'll close. Psalm 51.7. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me, now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you, Lord. Then, I will teach your ways to rebels and they'll return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, for sinning against you, God, for eating what I shouldn't eat, for drinking what I shouldn't eat, for looking at what I shouldn't look at, for treating people unkindly. Forgive me, O oh God. Forgive me, O oh God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O oh Lord that my mouth may praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.